So 1 Samuel chapter 15. Of course, the events of chapter 15 occur sometime likely in the early part of Saul's reign. And if you remember last week, we kind of had a synopsis there at the end. If you back up to verse 47 of chapter 14, it says, So Saul took the kingdom over Israel and fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab and against the children of Ammon and against Edom and against the kings of Zobah and against the Philistines. And whithersoever he turned himself, he vexed him and gathered an host and smote the Amalekites and delivered Israel out of the hands of them that spoiled them. It says in verse 52, And there was sore war against the Philistines all the days of Saul, and when Saul saw any strong man or any valiant man, he took him unto him. So we see that's, you know, kind of a synopsis last week. And then, of course, this story, you know, kind of probably played out somewhere in verses 47 through 52, you know, where Saul's going and, you know, smiting the Amalekites and delivering Israel out of their hands. And, you know, in, in this chapter, Samuel gives Saul the command to completely destroy the Amalekites. And some people might you know, read that and be taken aback. You know, sometimes there's some things in the Bible, you know, if you haven't read the Bible and you come to a church where the Bible is read and we go through and you're there to hear every chapter preached and every chapter read, you know, you're going to hear some things out of the Bible that might shock you. You know, and if you've never read the Bible and if you actually sit down and decide to read it all the way through cover to cover, you're going to read some things that will shock you. Right. The world wants to put this, this have, paint this picture of who God is today and it's not biblical. God is not, you know, God is love. We understand that. And God is, is all these good things. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father above in whom there is no shadow of turning. But here's the other thing about God. God is also a God of wrath and vengeance and justice. And God, you know, he, he, uh, he deals with people in yeah. Scripture and he deals with entire nations. Yeah. So if you look here in 1 Samuel chapter, uh, verse 1, it says there, Samuel said also, also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, uh, his people over Israel. Now therefore hearken to the voice of the, Lord, of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that he hath, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman. Now most people would say, oh, go slay man. You know, they'd say, okay, well, it's war, men die. But he goes on and says, he slay the men, slay the women. And then he says, slay the infants and slay the sucklings and the ox and the sheep and the camel and the ass. When he said to utterly destroy them, he means kill everybody and everything. Right. If it has breath in its lungs, it has to die. And we would say, well, what in the world is going on here? <coughs> well, you have to remember, God is repaying the Amalekites for their treatment of Israel all the way back in Moses' day. So this is, you know, many generations la later. You know, and this isn't just God randomly picking on some, you know, poor innocent country. This is a group of people that have been a thorn in the side of Israel since they've come into the land uh, of Canaan. You know, they've been fighting them. And, and go, over to, uh, go over to Deuteronomy chapter 18. I know we went through the book of Deuteron Deuteronomy, but let's remember who we're dealing with when we're dealing with the Amalekites. What kind of people? And God is repaying the Amalekites for their treatment of Israel in Moses' day. That's what he said there. He said, go smite Am at the Amalek and utterly destroy all that he hath. And why was that? Because I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. So he's talking about Moses, the Exodus, all of that. <clears throat> and God swore he, all the way back in Exodus 17, he said, and the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. So all the way back in Moses' day, God said, Look, I'm going to wipe these people out completely. He said, I, I, I will utterly uh, put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You know, if, if Amalek wasn't recorded in Scripture, nobody would know who they are. That's the only reason we, because that's the only remembrance there is that God allowed there to be is the remembrance that we see in Scripture. Because he completely destroyed these people. And it says in verse 15, And Moses built an altar, and they came, called the name of it a Jehovah Nissi. For he said, Because the Lord hath sworn uh, that the Lord uh, will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. And notice it's God that's having the war there. It's God is going to have war with them. God's going to fight against them you know, through his people Israel. But we have to remember, he's saying, well, it just seems kind of harsh. I mean, infant, suckling, women, even you know, the dog, the cat's got to get it, you know. <laughs> Everything, you know, they're taking goldfish out and they're throwing them on the ground. You know, they're killing everything. Yeah. 
But you have to remember that Amalekites, Amalekites were very wicked people, you know, which, were, which was what all the people were in the land of Canaan. The Canaanites, by the time Israel came back in the land, had, had become the most just you know, wicked, sinful group of people that were on the face of the earth. They were complete you know, reprobates in many instances. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. He says, When thou art come into land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. He's saying, look, when you go back, don't do what they do. Don't learn what they do. And he calls what they do, those nations in Canaan, including Malachites, abominable. He says an abomination. Look, it's one thing to make God mad. It's one thing to upset God. It's one thing to get involved in sin. It's another thing to, be a, to commit abomination. <laughs> and he says in verse 10, Thou shalt not be found. We say, well, what's, what's, what abominations is he talking about? Well, read on, verse 10. There shall not be found among you any that maketh, anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or useth the divination, or an observer of times, or enchanters, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things, these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out before thee. He said, look, I'm going to get rid of these people out of the land because they do all these things. And it says, you know, that they maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. He's not talking about jumping over a bonfire. He's talking about they burning them alive, sacrificing them to these false gods. That's what they're into. And then it goes on and talks about how you know, you're not going to have any enchanters, witches, charmers, consulters with familiar spirits, wizards, necromancers. These are all demonic people. These are the black arts. These are the, the occult that people are even into even to this day. You know, it's, it's being even lifted up. It's even being exalted in our own culture. You know, they're trying to make a, put a positive sp sp you know, spin on it. You know, Sabrina, the teenage witch. You know, Suffer not a witch to live, the Bible says. You know, Harry Potter, you know, another wizard. And God says, destroy them. They're not to, even, not to suffer them to live. And so on and so forth. That's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But what we see here is God, he says, he's not saying go easy on the Amalekites. It's the complete opposite. He's saying, go there and destroy everything of theirs. Destroy them completely. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, I'll begin reading in verse 17. It says, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way, when you were come forth from out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee, all that were feeble behind thee, when thou wast faint and wearied, and he feared not God. So these sound like some implacable people, unmerciful, implacable people. They're reprobate. People are going to go and smite the feeble that were behind when thou was faint and wearied, and they feared not God. They're godless heathen. They weren't going to be converted. They were only, all they were going to do is end up dragging Israel down. As God said, and he knew, that the only thing you could do with them is to get rid of them. It says in verse 19, Therefore it shall be, when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess, to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. You know, and this should give us some comfort is that, you know, God repays our enemies. You know, when we're weary and we're faint, and when someone's trying to kick us when we're down or pick on us, you know, God doesn't, God takes notice of that. Right. I'm not saying God's going to tell us to turn around one day and go and wipe out their family physically or something like that. But I'm saying, the Bible says, you know, vengeance is mine, say to the Lord, I will repay. Amen. And God keeps track. You know, when sometimes things happen to us and, we, and it seems like people that do us wrong get away with it. But you know what? Mark it down. God will pay them back. It might be many generations later. It might be, you know, years later in our life, but God's not forgetful. He says, thou shalt not forget it. And what this is really showing us is that you have to be tough on the wicked. You have to be tough on the wicked. I mean, that's, you know, you wonder why our society is the way it is today. It's because they're not tough on the wicked. You know, because uh, a sentence against an evil work is not, is not uh, swiftly executed, I'm paraphrasing, the heart, of men, it is, the heart of men is fully set to do evil. It's saying, look, the, the men, evil men look around and say, we get away with it. Nothing really that bad happens. And so they're fully set. Well, I'm going to go do evil. You know, you think about some of the worst elements of our society. You know, child molesters. You know, it's, it's, it's illegal to put a child molester to death in this country. It used to be. And I'm telling you, there's, there's child molesters. I'm telling you this is how they think. This is what the Bible says. The, because the, the sentence is not swiftly carried out, ex, uh, uh, you know, it's not executed quickly, 
Because, you know, judgment is not executed quickly against an evil work. Their hearts are fully set in them to do evil. They, they see some other, you know, child molester or whatever, some pedophile. He does what he does and he gets busted, you know, and now he's just, you know, he goes to jail for a few years, gets probation, gets put on a list, you know, has his face on the internet, isn't allowed to go into a school. You know, forget the fact that he's completely destroyed somebody's life. That he's just altered the course of somebody's life forever. You know, the Bible says that guy should be put to death. The rapist should be killed. And I'm telling you, if there were people out there that were getting killed for that kind of thing, yep. if these pedophiles were being put down like the Bible says they should be, there'd be a lot less of it going around. Yeah. There'd be a lot less of it going around. They'd say, because I mean, they're just sitting back and go, well, you know, if I do this, I might just have to go live, tax, you know, live on the taxpayer's money in some prison cell somewhere. Watch cable television, read some books. And they'll even put me in a, you know, the safe part of the prison. They'll put me in, they won't put me in the general population. And then maybe I'll even get some therapy. Maybe they'll go in there and they'll take me aside and they'll explain to me why, you know, I'm this way. And that's, that's why you have to be tough on the wicked. See, why is God wiping every, why all these Amalekites out? Because they're wicked. And, you know, you say, well, what about the kids? You know what? That should just be a lesson to us that the decisions we make as parents have a direct effect on our children. You know, I, I think, you know, I can't really tell you from this passage that, that the, the Malachite's children probably would have grown up to be wicked people themselves, and God already knew that. Right. Because they're going to be, a t t t you know, we're products of our environment. You know, they're just going to grow up and do the same thing. It's what they've been taught to do. But how, th how about this application? You know, your sin could bring down your family. Right. Your sin, Dad, your sin, Mom, could be the, the sin that brings down your family. And they go, well, it's just, I'm the one that's doing it. I'm the one that suffered. You don't know that. You don't know that, you know, God's going to judge you. He might just judge your family right along with you. That's what we see here. You know, that's a lesson we should all take heed to. Because we might destroy our own families with our sin. It's not just limited to us. But what I think the broader message here is this, is that you have to be tough on the wicked. Why? In order to love the righteous. You can't sit there and tell me you love righteousness and love godliness and love God's people if you're going to excuse the wicked. If you're not tough on the wicked, you can't say you love the righteous. Somebody who loves righteousness is going to hate iniquity. Somebody who loves the righteous is going to hate the wicked. Somebody who loves children is going to hate the pedophile. Someone who wants to protect innocent little kids is going to want to destroy the violent predator and see him put to death. <clears throat> and why is that? Otherwise, the good become bad. God's saying, look, don't go dwell with the Amalekites. Don't go in there and just, you know, meet them where they are and try to win them over, you know, witness to them. Do your lifestyle evangelism over there in the, in the land of Canaan. He said, no, get rid of them because it never works. You never see it in the scripture where the, the good make the bad good. It's always the other way around. That's exactly what happened to Israel. Is the, is the bad made the good bad. That's how it happens every single time. <clears throat> I mean, I won't take, a, uh, take the time, but I'll remind you of 2 Kings chapter 21 where you have Manasseh, who at 12 years old begins to reign over Israel, and he does even worse. It says there that his mother, uh, it goes on, it says, uh, he did evil with, uh, in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out the before the children of Israel. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and reared up the altars of Baal, which is basically the devil, Satan, and made a grove, and as did King Ahab, of Israel, Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them, and he built altars. And he made his son to pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. I mean, when you're getting into this stuff, you're, you're dealing with the demonic elements of, of the world. You're dealing with the demonic elements in, of the spiritual realm when you're getting into familiar spirits and wizards and things like that. You know, that's how we, that, this is something God considers an abomination. You know, sorry, I don't know who makes it. Is it Parker Brothers? Sorry, is it Parker Brothers or whoever makes it? Your Ouija board is an abomination. Right. And you should mess around with that stuff. And you say, oh, you Baptists, you old fuddy-duddies. Don't mess around with that stuff. Amen. It's real. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> That's what I, and you know what, even before I was unsaved, I mean, before I was unsaved, before I was saved, boy, that sounded bad. No ties up here telling them everybody's unsaved. <laughs> this, this church is going down fast. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm saying, no, uh, before I was saved is, is that I had friends that messed around with that stuff. 
And they all had, you know, several of my friends, they had horror stories about it. You know, we had one growing up and I never touched the thing. I remember looking at it. I mean, we might've gotten it out once, but I would just remember being so frightened of that thing. They told me like, what's it for? Oh, oh spirits will talk to you through it. I'm like, no thanks. <laughs> you know, I believe in that stuff. You know, there's, I believed in all that kind of thing. You know, that, that stuff was out there. And I don't want to start telling a bunch of ghost stories in here tonight, but you know, that stuff is wicked, you know? And that's what these Amalekites were into. And they were so into it where that they're so, they're so into communicating th through with, with their wizards and their spirits and everything else and getting their witches involved. And they're, and they're, oh, tell us what the spirits want. Oh, they want you to sacrifice your children. Oh, okay. And now they're burning their kids in the fire. That's who they are. Look, when, you, when, you've, when you've reached the point where you're burning your own kids and you're sacrificing your own children, you are a wicked and abominable nation that deserves to be wiped out. There's no, you can't bring people back from that. You know, and by the way, you know, we've got that going on in our own country in the form of abortion. Okay? And that's, that is another sermon in and of itself as well, but I don't want to make that the thrust of the sermon tonight. What I'm trying to get across right now is the fact that you have to be tough on the wicked. You have to be tough on them in order to love the righteous. Otherwise, the good become bad. <laughs> you can go back to uh, first, uh, first uh, Samuel chapter 15. And what we're seeing here in 1 Samuel 15 is that God's people must practice what's called tough love. And that's what I would entitle this sermon tonight, besides 1 Samuel 15, is tough love. You know, and we see this being practiced in several different ways in this chapter. You know, first of all, we see God telling Saul to go and destroy the Amalekites to do what? To have tough love. You know, he loves the, God loves the righteous. God doesn't want them to turn into like these Amalekites. He wants these people done away with. He wants to repay, uh, he wants to take vengeance on them for what they did to his people. You know, because he, he loves his people, he's going to practice some tough love, right? Who's, we've probably all heard of that, that, that term, tough love. <clears throat> we have to practice it. Otherwise, our nation turns into hell, is what the Bible says. You know, going soft on sin is going to destroy nations. Going soft on, on sin is what destroys nations. And that's why the moral fabric of our society is just unraveling before our very eyes right now. Because people are going soft on sin. And not just, you know, you know on, on, the, on the minor sins, if you want to call it that, you know, less, maybe things that were, aren't considered just complete abominations. You know, I'm saying beyond that. We've gone soft on just the most, the worst filth imaginable. People are just like, oh, well, you know, let them have their parade. Well, they're people too. You know, if they want to get married and, and adopt children, who are we to say? You're going soft on sin. Amen. You know, and the world can go ahead and go soft on sin, but I'm not going to. Amen. I'm not going to go soft on sin. Amen. And I don't want this church to go soft on sin, and I don't want you to go soft on sin. So we're going to tell it like it is. Right. And the Bible says that, you know, these homosexuals are abominations before God. Amen. You know, Leviticus chapter 21, verse 13. Amen. Or 2013. They deserve to be put to death. Right. You know, and that's in the New Testament too. Go read Jude. Go read, you know, these, these, go read Romans 1, that they which do such things are worthy of death, yep. the Bible says. True. Is that what our society believes? Nope. No. Far from it. They want to put rainbow stickers on everything and, 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 and you know, and crucify anybody who has, says anything to the contrary. Right. That's what they want to do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Come get me because I'm not backing down because I'm not going to go soft on sin. Amen. Because when you go soft on sin, that's how things get destroyed. That's how nations get destroyed. That's how churches get destroyed. You know, if I were to just get up here and just start saying, well, you know, I can't preach on that or I can't say this because somebody might get offended. You know what? Sin's going to run rampant in here. It won't be long before people are getting involved in all kinds of sin. So that's why preachers got to get up and preach against the adultery, preach against the divorce, preach against the drunkenness, preach against the pornography, preach against, you know, the drugs, the alcohol, the fornication. Preach, 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 and keep preaching it and keep preaching it and keep preaching it. Because they can't go soft on sin because when you go soft on sin, churches get destroyed. Nations get destroyed. Look, families get destroyed. When, when moms and dads go soft on sin, when they drop standards and they start letting kids do things that they, you know, they might not have otherwise done early, you know, in, at another time in their life, when they start letting them you know, just do whatever. Look, that will destroy your children. That will destroy families. 
It'll destroy individuals. You know, you shouldn't go soft on sin in your personal life. You shouldn't just say, well, you know, it's just this one sin. You should hate that sin. You should try to get all that sin out as much. Look, no one's going to reach this sinless perfection. I understand that. Yeah. But we can at least try. Right. You know, it's one thing to like, you know, mess up and make a mistake and, oh, I sinned. But it's another thing to say, well, you know what? It's just this one little sin. It's not that big a deal. I think I'll go ahead. Look, that one little sin you're going soft on is just going to blow up. And then it's this sin's okay. You know, what, I mean, I'm going I'm to lighten up on this sin and then this sin. It will destroy individuals. It will destroy churches. It will destroy families. It will destroy whole nations. The Bible says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. And by the way, that includes your beloved United, United States of America. Even that, even this country, if we forget God, and, and by the way, by, I may mean forgetting God, I mean forgetting this book. Yeah. By not practicing this book, by not preaching this book, by not living this book, that's what I mean by forgetting God. Not putting God, you know, oh, we're going to put God on the back of a coin or a dollar bill or have a national day of prayer and prayer to a, a God. We're going to have a prayer breakfast and have everybody, every religious figurehead show up. You know, that's not remembering God. In fact, that's going to anger God. <clears throat> that's another sermon. There's so many other sermons in this sermon. <clears throat> what we see with Saul <clears throat> is that he went soft on sin. He compromised with the wicked. Look at verse 4. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in uh, to lay him, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart you from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For he showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, which that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So he was so close to doing everything right. But what was it? It was just one guy. Just one guy. Because that's what it says. He destroyed all of them. But he kept one guy, the king, alive. And it says, But Saul spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and the fatlings and the lands and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse that they destroyed early. Now, I want to point this out before we get there. It says that Saul and the people spared them, right? Not just the people. Saul was involved. You'll see later when Saul gets called on the carpet for it, he says, oh, it was the people, right? So I'm pointing that out ahead of time. But Saul is compromising with the wicked. He's compromising with sin. What's he doing? He's going soft. What's he doing? He's not practicing tough love. This is tough love. When you've got to go out and destroy the wicked because you love the righteous. <clears throat> you know, and people, they do this, in the, this is what they do in their personal lives. You know, they, they, they reason away, re, you know, they reason away their obedience. They say, well, you know, I did the, I'm doing all these right things, so it's okay for me to do this bad thing. That's what Saul's doing here. He's compromising with sin. He's saying, look, I, we've been doing right. We, we destroyed all this stuff. You know, why not keep King Agag? You know, we'll go back and have fun with him. We'll make sport. We'll, uh, you know, we'll, uh, let's keep the, the best of the animals. You know, and we'll, even, we'll even put a spiritual spin on it and say, uh, you know, it's for the Lord. You know, people do this in their personal lives. People do this with sin in their life. They'll say, well, you know, I'm doing all these right things, so it's okay for me to, you know, do this. It's all right. Whatever that is. I mean, who destroys the best after all? You know, why, why would you get rid of the best animals? Why practice tough love? But look at verse 10. He says, Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. So God, here's, here's the lesson. God knows. Did anyone have to go tell God? God's watching. He's going, You didn't, destroy, you didn't, you didn't follow through. Oh, no, I destroyed all of them. Well, what's, who's king, what's King Agag doing here? What's this guy doing here? Look, God knows all the things we think we're keeping secret from everybody else. God knows all those secret sins. God, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord runneth to and fro throughout the whole earth, beholding the evil and the good. You know, God sees us. And God saw us all, you know, right when he, when he, when he, when he said, oh, this way, King Agag, you know, put the sword away. No, spare him. Spare the best of the ox and the sheep and so forth. And he comes to Samuel saying in verse 11, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel and he cried unto the Lord all night. So, you know, you got to kind of point this out too is that, you know, it grieved Samuel here. 
When God says, look, he's not, he's not obeying, he's compromising, he's going soft on sin, he's not following, he's through on what I told him to do, he's compromising, you know what? I'm gonna, I, it, it grieves me that he doesn't, that, and I'm going to, 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 it grieves me that I have set him up. You know, it grieves Saul. It repented the Lord and it grieves Saul. And it says he cried unto the Lord all night. I mean, he's deeply moved here, right? He wasn't just like, I knew it, that loser. It really bothered Samuel, I was saying Saul, but I meant Samuel. Samuel was deeply troubled by this. And why is that? Well, I think this is just more evidence for the fact, as I preached in the earlier chapters, is that Saul started out a very humble man. And I think, I think Samuel knew that about him. Obviously, he would have known that because he was the one that anointed him and watched him and, and went through, you know, had a, a close relationship with him for some time. I think that's why it really bothered him. I think that's why it grieved him so much because he knew how, how Saul started out. And now he's seeing Samuel, or excuse me, Saul, get to the point now where God's coming to him saying, you know what, I, I, it repenteth me that I made him king because he's disobeying. But here's, you know, here's another, here's another a, uh, instance of tough love, right? Samuel is, is, is deeply hurt by this. It grieves Samuel and he cries unto the Lord all night. But did that keep him from preventing some tough love with Samuel or Saul? Did that keep him from going, oh, well, you know, Lord, you got to understand, you know, Saul, you know, he was just a humble guy. And did he make excuses for him? Did he go and, and, and not do what he was supposed to do? No. Saul in this story also practices tough love. Excuse me, Samuel. I keep getting him mixed up. Samuel practices tough love when it comes to Saul. You know, it didn't prevent him. You know, his feelings, the, the fact that he cared for, for Saul, that didn't prevent him from practicing tough love. And look, that's a lesson to us as parents, that we need to practice tough love. If you really love your kids, you will practice tough love. You know, and we already preached a whole sermon about that. You know, that, and that was another sermon already, right? About disciplining your children and, and, and all of that, okay? But... You need to do that because of the fact that if you really love your kids, you're going to practice tough love because you want them to do right. And the parents that just give a complete unfettered access to whatever, you know, the internet or, you know, just let them do whatever they want, you know, a lot of times that ends up biting them. It starts coming back around and it, and it gets them. It haunts them. Just, well, whatever, you know, they just want to be the cool parent. Well, I just let them do whatever they want. I just want to be their friend. Look, that's not parenting. You're not there to be your child's friend. Look, and I've known parents like this. I've known parents who want, you know, they just, they, they're like, hey, just have the party here. Just bring the alcohol and the drugs over here. We'll all hang out. Right. It's wicked. That's not tough love. That's not parenting. And you know what? Here's, this is a great example of it because Saul or Samuel has feelings he cares for Saul. He's grieved. But then what does he do in verse 12? And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and both he set him up a place and has gone about and passed on and come down to Gilgal. So he's seeking him out. He's like, well, I've got to go give him the news. I've got to go see what's up. I've got to go deal with him. I've been up all night crying my eyes out. Been up all night grieved for him, hurting. But now I'm going to go take care of business. He's practicing tough love. It says in verse 13, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed be thou of the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. <laughs> you know what? I think Saul really believed he did too. I think he, he convinced himself, yeah, I did everything I was supposed to do. And that's what we do. We say, oh, I'm not in sin because X, Y, and Z. Because I did this and I did that. Of course God's pleased with me. Look at all the good things I'm doing. And we just gloss over you know, the King Agag in our life. And you say, oh, that doesn't matter. And he really believed it. And Samuel said, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, you sure did. No, he says, what meaneth this bleeding? What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And I love it because it's just a perfect picture of sin in our life. We're just like, we think, oh, there's no sin here. And it's just in the background, the sin's just like, meh, <laughs> meh. It's like everyone's like, well, no sin there, huh? It's like it, God sees it, God can hear it, it's obvious, but we're just we're just we're the only ones that can't hear it or see it. 
He's like, oh, really? You did everything. What meaneth all these sheep you know, bleeding and the lowing of the oxen, which I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people, sp and again, the people spared. You could see him. He's already kind of feeling the heat. He's like, oh, oh, that? <laughs> well, that was the people. They did that. They spared the best of the oxen to sacrifice the Lord thy God. So he starts blame shifting, right? We preached about that. And then he starts giving his excuses for why this is okay. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. <clears throat> and he says, Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. Gulp. And he just seems fully convinced here that he has done the right thing. He, I really think he thinks he did, too. I really think that at that point in, his, in the story, he's thinking, Yeah, I did all right. I, I mean, I chased him from here to there. I smote everybody. I killed everyone. You know, I, yeah, I saved the King Agag -Ag and a few sheep, but you know what? Generally speaking, I'm a pretty good guy. But what he's about to find out is that, you know, there's no loopholes with the Lord. When God says, this is what I want, that's what he wants. When God says, do this, means do this. When he says, don't do this, means don't do that. <laughs> It says in verse 17, And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed? Wherefore then did thou not, didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst evil in the sight of the Lord? Look, all the good that he did do, all the, all the people that he did destroy count for nothing because he, did, he, he, he failed. He just left one guy alive, just spared the best of the sheep. And it didn't matter what his motives were. He didn't practice tough love. And here he is, he's getting some tough love practice on him. Right? He says, look, you did evil in the sight of the Lord. God does, God's not even interested in the rest of it. He's like, I don't care about why you spared it. He said, you didn't do what I told you to do. And Samuel here is just nailing Saul right to the wall. I mean, he's just pegging him down. He's very specific about his sin, isn't he? He's saying, look, you flew upon the spoil. You did evil in the sight. You didn't utterly destroy them. He gets real specific. And, you know, in the, you know that is practicing tough love. You know, and here's the thing. A real man of God doesn't spare feelings. A real man of God isn't going to get up and spare people's feelings. If there's sin, he's going to deal with it. You know, if there's something that needs to be dealt with, he's going to deal with it. That's what a real man of God does. Right. He nails it down. He gets specific when he needs to. Yeah. <clears throat> Why is that? Out of love. Out of tough love. Right. <clears throat> Look, he doesn't spare the feelings of others, but he also doesn't spare his own feelings. I mean, you ever think about it from the preacher's perspective? Of what it's like to have to get up and like, well, I guess we got to deal with this. That's not fun. Right. I don't look forward to having to do that. I hope I never have to do that. You know, and thank God we have never really had to get specific up here in this church. And you know what? But I'm guaranteed there's going to be a day where we will. Some sin will creep in. And I'm not saying we're going to, you know, we have to get up and call out everybody, every little thing that they do. I'm not saying that. Because right. that's all church would be at that point. <laughs> Just every service would be like, all right, let's talk about everybody's sin. Because we're all sinners. We understand 1 Corinthians 5 and Matthew 18 and other, that, that the church is very limited. I, I don't want to go back over that. But I'm just saying, look, a real man of God, when he has to do that, is going to get up and do that. Not because he's mean, not because he, he enjoys it. Look, it's, it's no fun for me. I don't want to have to do it. And it's no fun for the person that's you know, getting dealt with. It's no fun for Saul in the story. Right. I mean, I'm sure he was squirming. I'm sure he was sweating. I'm sure he couldn't wait for that service to get over. I mean, he wanted to head for the door. But look, you have to deal with people and ha with tough love. To, why? You, you deal with sin because you love righteousness. You know, and, and people get things right. Go over to 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians. I should have had you turn there a while ago. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Actually, go over to Galatians chapter 1. That's what a real man of God does. He deals with sin. He doesn't spare people's feelings. I'm not saying he gets up and is a belligerent jerk. You know, you have to have tact. You have to know your boundaries. You have to know what's, uh, you know, what's appropriate and what's not. What's your business and what isn't. 
But when it's time to deal with it, he deals with it. <clears throat> Look at Galatians chapter 1. That's, I mean, this is exactly what, uh, what uh, Paul did. It says in verse 15, But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. I bet that was some sweet fellowship. I bet when he got there and he met Peter, Peter and they started talking about the Lord, I bet you they, there, was a, there was a friendship there. I bet you there was a, they were kindred spirits. I mean, we have that in this church. People get together, we talk Bible, you know, we share experiences, you know, we get to know each other, you form friendships. I mean, he's with them for 15 days, over two weeks, just, just chilling out with Peter, just talking, talking doctrine or whatever, getting to know each other. Right? He went up there and he said, I saw it to see Peter and both with him 15 days, but of other apostles say, I saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Go to chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. So 14 years later, he's going back to Jerusalem. Look what happens in verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. So his, this is his friend, Peter. One of the first apostles that he ever met that he spent time with, you know, that he had that experience with him, right? But you know what? When, when, when Peter was to be blamed, he withstood him to the face. He dealt with it. He didn't spare Peter's feelings. He didn't say, oh, well, you know, you're my friend. Look, that's respect of persons. You can't be like that. Right. You can't. Whether as a preacher, you know, you can't be like that in your house either. You can't be like that as a parent. You can't, you can't you know, let one kid off the hook and, and <laughs> come down hard on another. And so then people go to the other, but then people go, I'll just let them both off the hook. I'll just let everybody off the hook. No, you got to come down hard on everybody the same. That's right. what he's saying. You got to deal with sin when it's appropriate. Evenly, not be a respecter of persons. And that's what exactly what Saul or Paul is doing here. He says, look, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. Look at verse 14. When I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of Gentiles and not as do the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Look, you know, if you come to church long enough, and I'm not even saying I have to get specific because I know about something. Like, oh, I know what they're into, so I'm just going to preach on it. I guarantee if I just preach like I'm supposed to, eventually it's going to fall right in your lap. One day you're going to walk in and think, oh, it's going to be great. I can't wait to hear what the sermon's about. And it's just going to be like, boom! Like, you're just going to be smacked upside the face by the sermon. Well, how do you know? Because I've been smacked by so many sermons over my Christian life. How many times I've done that? Just, oh, I can't wait to go to church. And just, I'm like, oh, why do I even come here? You know? And it wasn't because, you know, the pastor was following me around, asking about me, seeing what I'm doing. You know? It's because the Holy Spirit. It's because the Word of God. It's because we're sinners. You know, and I'm not, you know, I'd be stupid to get up here and think like everybody in here is just, you know, as pure as the wind driven snow. <laughs> now, I'm sure that, you know, people are trying their best to live for God. I trust that. We always assume the best. But the reality is you and I, we're all sinners. You know, and, and if it gets to the place where you have to have, you know, <laughs> where, where it's said before them all, maybe, maybe not, or I'm calling out names, you know, if, but they, sometimes things can get to that point. But maybe the sermon is just feels like, boy, he's preaching right at me. You know, that's just the way it works. That's what we see here. Samuel is just nailing Saul to the wall. He's very specific about his sin. He's telling him exactly what the problem is. He's not sparing his feelings. He's practicing tough love. That's what we need to practice as Christians. Keep something there in the New Testament. We're going to come back. It says in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 20, it says, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king. It's like he's, he's confessing his own sin while he's trying to make, plead his case. And I brought King Agag. <laughs> yeah, that's the problem, Saul. That's, that, that's, that's exactly why you're in hot water right now. He said, look, I brought King Agag and I've utterly destroyed the, uh, the Amalekites, but the people took the spoil and the sheep and the oxen. Remember I note, told you to take note of earlier in the chapter? Yeah. It says Saul did that. He knew what was going on. And look, could he, have, he could have easily told the people, look, you're not taking that. And they would have listened. He said, look, we're not taking any of that stuff. We're not taking King Agag anywhere. We're going we're to kill him. 
We're killing everything. We're going to obey the voice of the Lord. You know, there's no weaseling out of this, Saul. <clears throat> and he's trying to, like, make his case, right? And, he, and, and what's he bringing up? We've brought the bet. We took of the spoil and the chief things that should have only been destroyed to give a sacrifice in the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So he's trying to dress it up. He's trying to make an excuse for his sin. It's like we brought all the livestock for God. But God's not impressed with livestock. Right? God owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. You know, he said, the fowls of the, the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine. God doesn't care about, like, you really going to impress God with livestock? Look what I brought you, God. He's like, I made that thing. Out of nothing. You know? The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof and the world that they that dwell therein. I mean, that was something David understood. Maybe that's what made David better. I mean, David's the one that said all that. He's the one that said, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. The world and, and, and that dwell in. He's like, God's not impressed with, with goats and sheep and oxen. <clears throat> and here's the thing about, you know, this is just kind of a sub point. It's just reading through the story and thinking about it. You know, Saul's bringing these livestock that, did he, did he go out and, 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 and breed them and care for them and build the fences and feed them? No. He went out and the, basically they're the spoil of war. And he's offering it to God. Look, it cost him nothing. Yeah. All he had to do is just go take it. It's somebody else's. And he's saying, oh, it's for God. And it just kind of goes back in what we talked about last, last week about how Saul was kind of this hyper-religious dude. He's kind of just turning in, just doing a lot of things for show. We've brought the best to a sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Oh, you brought the best to somebody else's livestock? You know, and that's kind of the difference between Saul and David. You know, we'll see later with, with David, you know, when, when, when he goes to build the, the, uh, the, 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 excuse me, when he goes to make a sacrifice in, in the, the, th the, th the threshing floor, I can't remember the guy's name. Ornan. Or, yes, thank you. Or, Ornan? The Jebusite. The Jebusite. Ornan the Jebusite, right? He says, he, he says, the Ornan the Jebusite says, you can have it. And he says, no, I will not offer in the Lord of that which cost me nothing. And he pays him for it. It's kind of a different attitude than Saul has here, right? Saul's just kind of like, well, you know, since we're killing the Amalekites anyway, and we're just going to kill these sheep anyway, we might as well go and sacrifice them on the Lord. They didn't cost you anything then. <clears throat> it was easy for Saul to offer somebody else's sheep. But look at verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices and obeying the voice of the Lord? And that's really, the, you know, when you hear this passage preached, typically that's really what's driven in. Is that God doesn't care about anything more than your obedience. It doesn't matter how great of a show you put on. It doesn't matter how sharp you look when you come to church. It doesn't matter, you know, whatever. If you're not obeying God, he's not impressed. Amen. Obedience is everything. Behold, to, better, it, to obey is better than sacrifice to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And what was it that the Amalekites were guilty of that God was destroying them over and along with all the other Canaanites? Witchcraft, idolatry, iniquity. And he says, look, you're just like them, Saul, when you rebel. And that's something we should all keep in mind. Is that when you rebel, whether it's against any authority in your life, you rebel against the church, you rebel against your boss at work, you rebel against your parents, rebel against God. God says, you know what? You're like a little witch. <laughs> it, you might as well be playing with that Ouija board. You might as well be, you know, biting the head off a pigeon and, and smearing them blood and painting pentagrams or whatever. You might as well get, that's what he's saying there. I mean, read it. Rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. That's what he said. To disobey. That's what it means to rebel. That's how wicked disobedience is in the eyes of God. And God puts a premium on what? On obedience. Of doing what we're told to do. God puts a premium on it. And even a little bit of disobedience costs Saul everything. I mean, he killed everybody else, but he left one guy alive. He killed the worst of any, everything that nobody would want anyway, and he kept the best for God. And God says, you didn't do what I told you to do. I don't care what your motive is. You disobeyed. That's like rebellion. That's like witchcraft. It's iniquity and idolatry. Things that God destroyed people over. 
God destroyed entire nations for these sins. And he says, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. You know, when, you're, when we start to disobey and, and become rebellious, we're, we're walking a fine line with God. And you know, God's long-suffering and merciful, but you might just get to the point where God just says, you know what? Have it your way then. And just turn you right over and just lift off the hand of protection and just let you suffer the consequences. <clears throat> That's what he said here. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, well, I'm going to do things my way. I'm, I, you know, I know better than God. I'm going to do things my way. Well, you know what? God has rejected thee from being king. <clears throat> and this reminds me of, of, of uh, what, I mean, you, you think about, okay, well, what's Saul, what's going on? What's going through his head here? And really what it was is he thought he was doing the right thing, but it's kind of a gutsy move, isn't it? You ever hear anybody say that? Well, that was a gutsy move. You know, you kind of, you were kind of roll, you were, I don't want to say it, I don't want to say it. <laughs> you were rolling the dice. You were taking chances, right? You were being gutsy. You know, sometimes that can backfire on you. I'll, I'll never forget, I, I was work. I can't remember all the details, but I, was, I had a, a job working for, it was actually my old pastor, and he was a roofer. And we were on some job, and I, and I was in, a, I don't know what it was, but I did something that was contrary to what he wanted done, but it turned out okay. And I was like, oh, all right. Whew. But I knew if I, if it, and he came, he said, you know what, that was a gutsy move. And he wasn't mad. He said, but you realize, if it didn't turn out right, how mad I'd be right now. <laughs> <laughs> think about that, right? You think, well, I'm just going to do it my way, and this will make them happy. But what if it go doesn't turn out right? Yeah. You know, sometimes the gutsy move backfires on you. Right. And you know what? Motives don't matter at that point. Saul so couldn't say, well, you know, I thought maybe God would like us to bring King Agag, and he would like the best of the sheep, because, you know, it seemed like a good idea. It's a gutsy move, Saul, and it backfired on you. And when it backfires, it doesn't matter what your motives were. It doesn't matter because it's disobedience. It's rebellion at the end of the day. It's not doing what you're told. God said, I want this exact thing done this way. Do it that way. That's all God's interested in. Look at verse 24. It says, And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy word. So he finally kind of comes to the light here. Because I feared the, but here, down the hill, here comes the excuses. But because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Right? So it's kind of an admission of guilt. Right? A little bit. He said, I've sinned. I transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words. But only because I feared the people. Look, the only reason I did that is because, you know, you know how they are. And God says, well, yeah, I do know how they are. So, you know, what, I'm going to let you off the hook. Nope. Doesn't matter. Like, you can't be afraid of what everybody else thinks. You know, sometimes doing the right thing is going to make you unpopular. Sometimes doing the right thing is going to get you made fun of. But it's more important for you to do the right thing than to try and make everybody else happy. He says in verse 24, Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. So, I mean, he's just, he's like, look, I'm, you're done. And this is interesting. He says, and as Samuel was turned to go, uh, to go, about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and it rent. So whenever I read this, it, you know, you have to think about what's going on. It's not like Saul's being, manip he's not being malicious here. Oh, you're not going to worship? I'm just going to tear your clothes. Right? What's happening is he says that he laid upon the skirt of his mantle. The skirt is like the, the outermost part of the garment. Right? So he's got this mantle on and this probably this, this skirt that hung down low or something. So he's probably, I envision it. His, he's like, wait, no, don't stop. Don't go. And he's like falling and just, just grasping at it. Say, come back. And he ends up tearing it in the process accidentally. <coughs> so Samuel, uh, you know, he practices his tough love and he cuts Saul down to size. And then he says in verse 28, And saw Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. You know, sometimes you don't realize what you have until it's gone. And that's when you really regret not obeying. You know, that's what he's realizing here. He's like, he's like well, turn again and worship with me. Nope, not going to do it. And he's like falling all over himself to try and get him to come back. 
He's tearing his garment. <coughs> and he just turns and says, you know what? It's rent. It's never coming back. The kingdom's gone. It's done. And he says, it, he has rent it from thee this day and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And I love that phrase. Look, he's better than you. <laughs> that flies in the face of this culture today, doesn't it? How dare you suggest that anybody is better than somebody else? You know what the Bible says? There's people that are better than other people. I'm not saying, and I'm, you know what? And it's not based upon skin color or orientation or whatever. Just there's some people that God looks at and says, that person's better than that person. That's what he's saying here. You know what that tells me? Is there's no participation trophies with God. You're not going to get to heaven and be like, well, I, you know, I know I was backslidden the whole time and in and out of church and I didn't do anything for you, but don't I? No, you don't. Or aren't I just as good as them? No, you're not. They're better. <laughs> the people that serve God are better. The people that obeyed and did what they were told are better than you. Not because of who they are, but because of what they did. And look, it's available to anybody. Look, Saul could have obeyed. Saul didn't have to do everything he did. He brought this upon himself. You know, I'm running out of time, but go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I, I should have had you stay there. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3, Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Look, if you do the work, you're going to get rewarded. You know what? If you don't do the work, you're not going to get rewarded. And this whole, you know, participation trophy culture is a, is a, is a sham. And it's, not, and it's teaching people the wrong thing. You know, and it goes all the way back, you know, all the way back to when I was in second grade, which wasn't that long ago, all right? But I remember, you know, it was track, we had track and field day in elementary school. Do they even do that anymore? Is that a thing still, track and field day? Everyone's homeschooled. <laughs> Nobody knows. Every day at our house is track and field, buddy, right? <laughs> But they had, you know, we had the, we'd have the different sprints and the marathon, or the, not marathons, but you'd run and do the long jump and all these other things. You know, and I didn't, I did, was no good at any of them. <laughs> Big surprise, you know. <laughs> Never was a runner, folks. I know it's a shocker. <laughs> not much of a jumper either. It's really good at falling on things. But, but there was this one event that, I, that I, I placed in, and it was like some stupid thing they made up where you had to throw frisbees into like a hula hoop and whoever got the most in. Second grade, okay? Was, it's not in the Olympics, I know. But, but I won. I got second place. And I was feeling pretty good. And then a teacher came to me and said, you know what? Enough girls didn't win. We have to take that away from you and give it to a girl. <laughs> that is burned in my mind. I've been harboring that for, for nigh on 30 plus years. I'm finally letting it out tonight. I've never told anybody about that. But that, you know what, as a little, I'm over, look, I'm over it, okay? I really am. But you know what, as a little second grade Corbin, you know, imagine my little boy, right? Little Corbin. That broke my heart. I mean, I'm, I'm just getting smoked at this dash and this run and this jump. I can't place anything. I finally get a couple frisbees and a hula hoop and I'm feeling pretty big, for, pretty good. And it's like, oh, well, that was a very good job. But guess what? We got to take that away from you and give it to somebody else who didn't, who didn't win. And I was just like, this whole thing's just, this is, you know what? And I was pretty, that jaded me from that day on. I'm done with sports. I was just like, Pfft. that's when I got into the independent sports, you know, or anyway. <laughs> You're like, you didn't get into any sports, buddy. <laughs> 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 anyway. But look, that's what this, 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 this participation trophy culture, everyone's a winner. No, not everyone's a winner. But, you know, it, in order to be a winner, there has to be a loser. That's, that's the reality of the situation. And you know what? That translates into the spiritual life, life as well. You're not going to get to heaven and be like, everyone's getting a ribbon today. Everyone's, everyone placed. You know, some people are going to outshine others in heaven. That's what the Bible says. That there will be some people who shine, have a brighter, sh literally shine brighter than others for the work that they did here. The Bible's saying here, look, we're gonna, every man's work's going to be burned. And if you worked and any of your works abide, you're going to receive a reward. But if, it says, but if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Yet he himself shall be saved, yet so by us by fire. You know, so some people are going to get to heaven and they're not going to have anything. And that's just the way it is. And we ought to lay that to heart. 
And you know the people that are going to get the rewards are the people that do what? That obey, right? The people that do what God wants us to do. <clears throat> now, I want to clarify this before I, I want to close on this thought is that, because I mean, what are, we even, what are we even talking about? Like tough love, right? You know, God practices tough love. He sent the children of Israel in there to wipe out the Malachites out of tough love because he loves righteousness and he hates iniquity, right? And that's what we need to practice as a society. You know, we saw Saul came and practiced tough love on Samuel. You know, he was grieved, it bothered him, he, he was felt sorry for him, but he didn't let his feelings get in the way and he told him the way it, how it is. He called out his sin and he dealt with it, right? He practiced tough love. That's what we're talking about. But let me just clarify this by saying this. There's a difference between tough love and kicking somebody when they're down. Okay? Look at first, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. It says in verse 6, Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. And he's referring back to 1 Corinthians about the guy who's committing fornication with his father's wife and he said, put, put away uh, that wicked one from among you. Right? He said, kick the guy out. And they did, right? In 2 Corinthians, now he's writing, he's following up, and he's saying, look, sufficient unto man is the punishment which is afflicted of many. He's saying, look, you kicked him out, and the guy went out, and he got right. And by the way, that's why we practice this here. Right. Because it works. Right. Because people that get kicked out of church, it's a wake-up call sometimes. They snap out of it, and they say, wow, I'm going to destroy my life. I'm going to quit committing this sin that got me kicked out of church and get right. It happens all the time. You know, and the, our church gets a lot of criticism from people, mainly from people who don't go here, you know, the online community, for kicking people out. They say, all you do is kick people out. Yeah, but they don't see everybody that comes back in. Well, how come you don't hear about them? Because we don't bring it up to them. They don't go say, oh, hey, everybody, so-and-so's back. He's done committing fornication. They're con done being a drunk. Just want everyone to know. Right? Are you done? Yeah, okay, good. Right? That's not how it works. Look, they quit. They say, hey, they come back. They come to the pastor or whatever. And they say, hey, you know, I'm sorry. I repent. He says, yeah. And they show up and it's like, we don't mention it again. And that's how God is with us. You would like God to just remind us every day of that sin he forgave us for? Hey, remember that sin you were confessing to me about? Remember that? I just want to see if you remember. <laughs> that's not how it works. God's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Sometimes we go to God, we, re we apologize for things that we've already confessed, and he's just like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Because it's under the blood. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, we commit some sin, and then we get right with God, we confess it, and then we feel guilty, we come back later, and God's like, what are you talking about? Because he forgot about it. And look, he doesn't, he, you know, God practices tough love, but he knows where to draw the line. And that's what Paul's saying here. He said, look, sufficient of the man is the punishment that was inflicted of many. So that contrary is he ought to rather to forgive him and to comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. You know why we practice tough love is because we love people. Tough love, right? It's not just tough. It's tough love. It's done out of love. And there's a difference between, you know, practicing tough love and then just kicking somebody when they're down. You know, we're real good about, you know, shooting the wounded sometimes and just you know keeping people down a lot some people they I, I think they they enjoy it they love it when somebody gets into some sin and it's it's the new you know it's the new scuttlebutt and they can't wait to talk about it and then when so-and-so gets right it kind of bugs them like oh well now what, now what are we going to talk about that's the wrong attitude that's not a loving attitude look in verse 32 there first samuel chapter 15 it says then samuel then said samuel Bring ye hither to me, Agag, the king of the Malachites. So he says, you know what? All right, I'll turn. I mean, he's, Saul's throwing himself at his feet, turning, no, don't leave, come back and worship with me. He's like, God's rent the kingdom from you. But you know what? All right. What's he doing? You know, he, he's not kicking Saul when he's down. He's like, you've had enough for today, Saul. You've got enough bad news. I'll go back and we'll, we'll worship together. And notice what it says here. And Samuel sent, said, Samuel, bring me ye hither to me, Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And he says, I'm going to show you what you should have done. And Agag, king, I love this. You know, I know I've got to wrap up, but every time I read it, I can just see Agag coming like, <laughs> you know, it says he came to him delicately, you know, just like, hey, how's it going? You know, you just saw his entire 
you know, everybody he knew just get slaughtered. And he's the last one alive. And he came delicately and he said, surely the bitterness of death has passed. <laughs> right? And Samuel said, as thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. Burn. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord. Look, he didn't just slay him. Right? That's all God wanted. All God wanted was just Agag to be dead. You know, just, you know, make it quick. Whatever. He just wanted him dead. But Samuel, when he gets his hands on him, he doesn't just kill him. He hews him in pieces before the Lord. I mean, he kills him, and then he's just like... I mean, that's gruesome. That's a man of God doing that. And it says he's doing it before the Lord. And it doesn't say, and God was disgusted. And God was displeased. No, God's like that. That's how you do it. I <laughs> mean, he, 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 what is this showing us is this, I think, I mean, this is his zeal. He's like, I'm not just going to kill this guy in front of you. I'm going to hew him up in little pieces. I'm going to hack him up. <laughs> He's like going to this extreme, right? So called. But here, you know, this is the difference between fake zeal and real zeal. This is the difference between fake zeal. I mean, Saul had a lot of fake zeal. We killed everybody. We saved the best to sacrifice for God. We brought, you know, we brought the King Agag back. Oh, we're so spiritual. We're so zealous. You know, you're fake because you didn't obey. That's what God, that's all God wants. The guy who obeys, that's the guy who has the real zeal. The guy who's just like, I just want to do whatever God wants me to do. Whether I get credit for it or not, whether anybody knows it or not, I just want to obey the Lord, serve him and please him. That's what I want to do. That's the real zeal. Fake zeal just does what it thinks is best. Right? It just thinks, well, I think this is what's best because I'm so zealous. I know that's what God wants, but I think this is what we should do. And, what, and the reason why they like is they're just hoping to impress people. They just want to impress everybody around them. They just want to go to Gilgal and have their, oh, look at what we did and look at how holy and how much we love the Lord. Look, look, look. But real zeal, it obeys. That's what it does. It kills Agag, right? But not only that, it goes to the extreme of obedience. Right? It doesn't leave things undone. He's like, I'm not only going to obey the Lord, I'm going to go to the, um, I'm not just going to kill Agag, I'm going to hack him up. That's real zeal because he's obeying, but then he's going even beyond <laughs> what he was supposed to do. He's saying, look, this is all God wanted, but now I'm just going to go ahead and do a little bit more for him. I'm going to obey, and then I'm going to add some more obedience on top of that. You know, and this is the way people should look at their sin. They should say, you know what, I'm going to get the sin out of my life but I'm going to hack it up in little pieces. This is why people keep going back to sin in their life. Because they never learn to hate it. You think Samuel hacked up Agag just, to, just because he felt like it? He hated this guy. He says, you've made women ch childless, now your mother's going to be childless. He hated what that guy stood for. He hated for his wickedness and his idolatry and his iniquity. And his, you know, he's just a murdering scumbag. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to make an example of this guy. I can't stand this guy. I'm not just going to kill him. I'm going to hack him up. And that's the way we need to be with our sin. People, you know, if you want to get some sin out of your life, learn to hate that sin. Learn to hate it. Not just, oh, I need to get it out. I just need to, you know, slit Agag's throat and just let him bleed out. That's not going to work. You need to get mad. Say, I'm going to hack this thing up once and for all. There's going to, you know, you're not going to put Humpty Dumpty back together when I'm done with him. This guy's going to be little bits. You know, real zeal, it obeys to an extreme. Okay? And then he says in verse 34, Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Saul came no more to see Saul. Samuel, excuse me, came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. And of course, that's with the witch at Endor, right? Nevertheless, which proves, by the way, that that really was Samuel that appeared. Some people question that sometimes. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So he says, you know what? <coughs> this hasn't changed anything. I'll come back. We'll take care of Agag. But this doesn't change anything between me and you. You're still rejected. And I'm not going to see you for the, until, you know, he wasn't going to see him ever again. And here's the thing. Tough love is necessary. And tough love is hard on both parties involved. Tough love is, that's why so many people shy away from it. The people that should be, you know, enforcing tough love, sometimes we back off because it's not easy. It's not fun. We don't like it. That's why there's a lot of preachers out there that are just never going to get up and preach about anybody's sin. 
Say, oh, I don't want to make you upset. I don't, we'll just pass over that. Oh, no, that's going to make people mad. Nope, I don't upset people. Well, it's just going to make people feel good. Look, that's not tough love. Tough love is hard on both parties. It's hard on the people being, you know, receiving it, but it's also hard on the people giving it. You know, it's hard on Saul, you know, to have the kingdom rent from him, but it was also hard for Samuel to come and deliver this message and then say, you know what, I'm not even going to see you again. Because I honestly believe Samuel loved Saul. I mean, when he hears the news from the Lord, we read, he's up all night just... Ah! It, bugged, it bugged him. But I'm trying to encourage you tonight is this. Don't avoid doing the hard thing. Don't avoid doing the hard thing. Don't avoid doing the right thing. Look, the right thing is often the hard thing. Right? That's often the hard thing. The hard thing is, is usually the right thing to do. Right. But we're living in a world today where everyone wants just the path of least resistance. Even if it means being wrong. Even at the expense of being right. Even at the expense of obedience, even at the expense of, 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 you know, being pleasing to God. Well, you know, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but it's easy. Well, you know what? It was easy for Saul to not kill King Agag. It was easy for Saul to bring back a bunch of nice sheep and oxen and, and go have a big feast down in Gilgal. It was easy to sit there and have to, you know, kill. We've been killing all these people. I got to keep killing people? Yeah, because that's what God wanted. God wanted everything destroyed. God puts a premium on obedience. Look, that's why we should be obedient and that's why we should demand obedience through tough love. Let's go ahead and pray.